This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is brought to you by Lexipol, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit lexipol.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Now let's get into the show. Welcome, everybody, to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzow. With me, as always, is the captain of the ship, Janelle Fasquet. Janelle, how are we doing today? Fantastic, Aaron. How are you? I'm great. Today is a very special uh, episode because we have the captain, which you are. You're kind of the brains behind uh, this podcast. We have the admiral. We have the brains behind the organization (laughs) Uh, with us today, the boss, uh, who I am trying to be on the best behavior, and I've already messed up a couple times, but uh, welcome, Gordon Graham. Thanks for being here. How are you, sir? An absolute honor, Aaron, and thanks for taking the time to do this and uh, really looking forward to this. Well, again, you are uh, one of the founding, I should say fathers, one of the founding uh, members of Lexapol. And for our listeners that don't know all the different things that you're involved with and all the accolades, um, First and foremost, you're a risk management expert and, and, and a practicing attorney, by the way. You're a 33-year veteran of law enforcement, and I like to call you the fire service's favorite, can't say cop, uh, but uh, you would rather us call you the fire service's favorite well, you know, patrolman. favorite state trooper, highway patrolman, state because trooper. we're a little bit taller than the cops are, just a little bit. Yeah, so. of course. Okay. Uh, exactly. So it's science. Uh, and, uh, and along with that, over the years, you've presented uh, just a common sense approach to risk management to, to hundreds of thousands of public safety professionals around the world. Again, co-founder of Lexapol, where you serve on the board of directors. And I, I might uh, add that we're here um, because of you. And, and thank you for having the vision to start Lexapol. Do you remember that first kind of thought? You're, you're like, hey, public safety needs kind of my thought process. We need, you know, a company that's just focused on risk management and on policy. Do you remember, was there ever a, a kind of a, a, a come to Jesus moment if it, if where, where it all lit up and made sense for you to, to, to pursue this? Well, actually several of them, but the light got brighter and brighter and brighter as time went on. And we've just celebrated our 20th anniversary, but that question was asked a lot in the interviews for the 20th anniversary. So what made you start thinking about this? My earliest recollections was 1975, when I was a motorcycle cop for the California Highway Patrol. And one night I was on my Kawasaki and uh, I light a guy up and he decides I'm not stopping tonight. And so the chase is on. And uh, LAPD got involved in the chase and Los Angeles Sheriff's Department got involved in the chase and Santa Monica Police Department got involved in the chase and Torrance Police Department was involved in the chase. and. I'm looking at the tactics of these other cops and I'm saying, I can't do that on the California Highway Patrol. And I later learned that, you know, the CHP pursuit policy was completely different than the LAPD pursuit policy, which was completely different than the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department policy, which completely different than Torrance PDs and Santa Monica PDs. And just, I was in graduate school at the time in the Institute of Safety and Systems Management. And I'd like to explore that a little bit with you later on. But one of the things I learned there is this standardization of best practices in high-risk industries. When everybody's got a different way of doing business, this is a ticket for tragedy. Well, wait a minute. We're all working out of the same California state law. We're all working out of the same federal law. Why does every police department have a different policy manual? And that idea grew and grew and grew between 1975 and year 2000. And about that time, I met Bruce Prayett, another cop turned lawyer, and he and I were on the lecture circuit together and he was teaching civil liability and I was teaching managing risk and we put our heads together. And out of that, uh, just slightly over 20 years ago came Lexapol. The idea at that point in time was to standardize policies, procedures and training in California law enforcement. But over the next 20 years up till to now, it's grown greatly. And I, I couldn't be more proud where we are and uh, very proud of the operations. And again, thank you for inviting me on this uh, podcast today. Well, and, and let's let's move it to the fire service then. When was kind of the uh, biggest transition or, wh- or when all of a sudden did you realize, okay, the fire service needs this too? And obviously the fire service knows it because you've been very, very popular speaker and, 
and obviously your your risk management ideas have grown. You know, and I've heard I heard you've lectured numerous times. Uh, I've I've seen the old overhead projector uh, videos, um, and also of course fire departments like to play the trick on you where the overhead projector goes out. Of course, because we like to play some tricks on cops. I know that. Um, but when did you start branching over into the fire side? Well, uh, you know, it was two transition periods. I was at a public safety conference once and I met Chief Alan Bernasini. And uh, Alan Bernasini started talking to me. I had no idea who he was. I had no idea what he had done for the fire service, but he seemed like a nice, affable grandpa. And I started talking <laughs> to him and he started inviting me to his programs that he had on a national level in uh, Notre Dame area and also in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. But I think the big turning point came in 1998. Now let's go back to 1975, 76, 77. Uh, three years in graduate school at the Institute of Safety and Systems Management. And if you wanna Google it, you can. University of Southern California, ISSM. Our United States military in World War II had an absolute abysmal safety record. Uh, for those of you who have never read the great book, Unbroken, the story of Louis Zamperini, mm -hmm. later a movie by Angelina Jolie, one piece of data jumped out of the book and floored me. The United States Army Air Corps, training pilots during the war, training pilots, was suffering on average 19 fatalities per day in training exercises. And there was lots of stories of this on how many people were dying from what they used the word accidents and illness. And at the end of the war, the military said, we got a problem. So they contracted with the University of Southern California to build this ISSM the Institute of Safety and Systems Management, a program designed to educate military leaders on the principles of risk management. And 25 years later, 1975, they opened the program for non-military personnel. And I got lured into that program. And uh, over that three-year window, I got hooked on the study of tragedy, why things go right, why things go wrong. During that three-year window, I was introduced to the work of H.W. Heinrich, H-E-I-N-R-I-C-H for the listeners who want to do something with this. <laughs> and he was an adjuster with Travelers Insurance Company. And he came up with is now called his triangle of probability. More simply stated, the mathematical relationship between close calls, mishaps, and tragedies. And the bottom line is, every time we have a close call, when a group of people who do the same or similar job, and state troopers around America are a group of people who do the same or similar job, when they have 300 close calls, near misses, one in, uh, one in 10, 30 and 300, will end up in a mishap. The sprain, the tear, the rip, the bruise, the fall, the cut, the impact, the property damage event, one in 300 will end up in the tragedy, the death or great bodily injury. And historically, we try to learn from the deaths and great bodily injuries. The better idea would be to learn from the mishaps because they're much more frequent and much more, uh, much less severe. But the best idea would be to learn from the close calls because they're 300 times more frequent with no severity at all. And my thesis was entitled Non-Punitive Close Call Reporting, uh, an open forum for cops to share their close calls without fear of embarrassment, without fear of discipline. And I could get no one in law enforcement interested in this. No one. But I'm doing a fire chief conference in uh, Pennsylvania in 1998, and I talked about close calls. And a fire chief comes up to me after the program and says, I almost vomited while you were talking about close calls. And I said, why? He said, I almost got cut in half on a fire ground 15 years ago. And I've never talked to anybody about it because what I was doing was so stupid. And I don't want anybody to know how stupid I am. If I tell you what happened, will you share with other firefighters? I said, sure. He goes, don't use my name. I said, that's easy. I don't know your name. Don't even <laughs> use my department name. I said, that's easy. I don't know your department name. Don't even say Pennsylvania. Well, there's only 2,315 fire departments in Pennsylvania. Nobody's going to narrow it down. So he tells me this harrowing story about how he almost got cut in half. I'm just a dumb cop, and I'm getting scared. It was a very scary story. And he shook my hand. And the very next fire chief in line, this guy, a big bushy mustache, he comes up, he says, that was a pretty interesting story he told you. I said, I think it was uh, confidential. Well, he told you, didn't he? I said, yeah. He goes, you going to share with other firefighters? I said, I am. He goes, how many firefighters you talk to every year? I said, a couple thousand. And he says to me, I got this thing called the secret list. 
the mm-hmm. secret list. And email was relatively new in 1998. He yeah. said, I got 4,000 fire chiefs. You write it up tonight, redact it, make it look pretty. I'll send it out to 4,000 fire chiefs tonight. And I said, whoa, you and I need to have dinner. And out of that came firefightercloscalls.com, an open forum for firefighters around the world to share their close calls without fear of embarrassment, without fear of discipline, with the goal of preventing future firefighters from getting hurt. And we've had remarkably good success with that website. It's not for profit. Nobody's making any money on this. Uh, As a matter of fact, I finance that website. Billy runs it. I finance it simply so we don't have to take any advertisement money. And if we want to tell the truth about a piece of equipment, we're going to tell the truth about a piece of equipment with no one telling us you can't say that. The site got so popular that in 2005, Billy and I helped the International Association of Fire Chiefs build their website, firefighternearmiss.com. Again, the same goal, an open forum where people can talk about their close calls before they end up in tragedies. So that's uh, that was my introduction to the fire service, and that got me some national recognition and uh, been very, very fortunate. It uh, It's still going today, kind of like uh, Chief Goldfeder's mustache. It's still very popular and growing. And um, I guess a, a question on that, though, is, that resource is out there, and I've uh, personally had quite a few people send me things from there over the course of the years. What's the message you you uh, want to kind of convey to those members that, oh, that will never still happen to me? Even though they read about it, they don't. And, and maybe what's the reason that that doesn't lead to action? Well, uh, you know, it's a, a multifaceted question. I appreciate you trying to confuse the cop on a firefighter web show here, <laughs> you know, Dang it. but the multifaceted question is, uh, number one, what, what's the goal? Well, the ultimate goal is preservation of life. And the fire service historically has done a very fine job at preserving life in our communities and simultaneously have done a pretty lousy job at preserving the life, not just length of life, but quality of life for the fire service personnel. So that's one goal is to get people to learn things that will help them better protect their community and simultaneously better protect themselves. Why people don't act on it? Amanda Ripley is on my recommended reading list. And for anybody who wants this, my reading list is at lexapol.com forward slash presentations. And Ms. Ripley has a great book called The Unthinkable. And the theme of her book is these unthinkable events these things that just don't happen here in our little small agency, they have a very nasty habit of popping up every now and then. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Amanda Ripley's book is fantastic, but why don't we listen to these things? Well, I'm, I'm trying to be polite here, but like law enforcement, the fire service suffers from arrogance, ignorance, and complacency. Arrogance. Yeah, nothing bad's gonna happen to me. Ignorance. I had no clue that could possibly happen. Complacency. You know what? I've been doing this job for 30 years. You know, bad things are not going to happen to me. So when you when you put these three things together, arrogance, ignorance, and complacency, uh, that's a problem lying in wait and is ultimately going to end up with somebody getting hurt. What's the best way to combat that? Well, you know, the, the training component, with regard to arrogance, I want to hire good people. And I think the fire service, by and large, hires pretty good people. You know, the background investigation process to, to weed out those who are convinced that rules do not apply to me. The hiring process, uh, a lot of it gets down to first-line supervision. Supervisors, uh, when I do my class on supervision, uh, everybody gets a three-by-five card at 8 o'clock in the morning. These are in-service fire captains, by the way, and fire lieutenants, company officers. Everybody gets a three-by-five card. So what's the primary mission of a company officer in your fire department? Write it down on the three by five card. And when I was doing this a lot, you go around and pick up the cards, literally half the cards had nothing written on them. So either they don't know or they don't want to cooperate with a cop, you know, but when I do read answers, you know, oh, my primary mission is uh, making sure the overtime checks are received on time. Mm-hmm. My primary mission is, uh, Uh, making sure the air conditioning is on early on hot days. My primary mission is, no, the primary mission of a company officer is systems implementation, enforcement of organizational policy. Management builds the rules. Management keeps the rules up to date. The primary mission of that supervisor is enforcement of organizational policy. And for all the chiefs that might be listening to this, if you promote people who can't or won't enforce policy, that's a huge problem lying in wait. You know, and show me a tragedy in the fire service. And I don't care what it is. The loss of public trust, 
the uh, criminal issues, the civil liability issues, the organizational embarrassment. You show me a tragedy in the fire service, I will show you approximate cause of X. And the real problem lying in wait all too often is a supervisor not behaving like a supervisor or in the alternative, a supervisor who tried to behave like a supervisor and got no support from management. Mm -hmm. If either of those is present in any public safety agency, and I'm talking about the fire service today, that is a huge problem lying in wait. So how do we select, how do we mentor, how do we develop, how do we train the next generation of supervisors? And the third component of this, of course, is making sure that your fire service personnel, all of them are fully and adequately trained to perform their rightful work. Well, and I think this ties in, I mean, this is a perfect segue to the five uh, root causes, right, of fire service tragedies. We've got people, policy, training, supervision, discipline. Did I get them right? Yep. Yep, very good. And those are, I mean, when you really boil it down, everything kind of comes back to one of those, correct? Well, there are thousands of proximate causes for tragedies. The event that instantly preceded the tragedy, I'll call that the proximate cause. Uh, when you go back in time and look for the root causes, what really caused it, it got down to those five things. Sometimes it's a lack of quality people. Sometimes it's a lack of quality policy. Sometimes it's a lack of good training. Sometimes it's supervisors not behaving like supervisors, and sometimes it's a lack of organizational discipline. Well, I'm a big fan of a theory known as analogs. If B is caused by A, let's fix A. So the problem becomes the solution. If you want to avoid tragedies, give me good people who have good policy, constant ongoing training, supervisors behaving like supervisors, and discipline when rules are not being followed. Do you find that one of those tends to be rise to the top more often than the others? No, those five pillars are inextricably intertwined with each other, supporting your organization. And there's a natural tendency to want to prioritize. No, these are pillars holding up the fire department. Take one away, the whole house of cards is going to start falling apart. So as the chief officers, you know, you have that obligation of getting and keeping good people. And in, when I talk my long programs, I divide that into five areas, recruitment, backgrounds, probation, performance evaluations, and decertification processes. When people cross that bright line of ethics and integrity, not only get rid of them from your department, but get them out of the profession. They have no business in this profession. With respect to policy, making sure policies are properly designed, kept up to date, and fully implemented. And that's the role that Lexapol has. With respect to training, uh, initial training in the fire service is pretty good. My worry is the ongoing training. And my pitch is, Let's make every day a training day and not random training, but focus training and focus the training on what I like to call the core critical tasks. A simple definition, tasks that are very risky, done very rarely with no time to think. Now, in the cop world, pursue, don't pursue is a core critical task. Shoot, don't shoot is a core critical task. In the fire service world, uh, AED usage is a core critical task. Very risky, done very rarely with no time to think. Two in, two out is a core critical task. Very risky, done very rarely with no time to think. Bomb threats, very risky, done very rarely with no time to think. Identify the core critical tasks and make every day a training day, which brings us to supervision. Again, the primary mission of that supervisor is enforcement of organizational policy. Hey, Chief, how do you select, how do you train, how do you mentor, how do you develop the newest generation of supervisors? And finally, pillar number five, the discipline component, rules without enforcement are just nice as pieces of paper, a piece of words on pieces of paper up on a shelf someplace. You know, having a piece of paper saying that, you know, oh yeah, everybody knows that. No, discipline. When people don't follow rules, it needs to be addressed. And the big problem in both of our professions and seemingly, in my opinion, more in the fire service is discipline has turned into a function of outcome. Well, how did it end up? Oh, it ended up great. It ended up great. You know what? I'm not in your business, but I ain't talked to enough fire chiefs. You could have a structure fire end up A-OK, -okay, in which there's major violations of safety rules. You got lucky. You cannot rely on luck. You have to rely on process, the policies. When people don't follow rules, it needs to be addressed, notwithstanding the outcome. Just because things end up okay does not mean we don't have problems lying in wait. Well, I like how you explained how everything is inextricably linked. And I think that also connects. You wrote a great article for us a few years ago about the chief as the chief risk 
manager. And this idea, and I think, I mean, it, but it applies at all levels because everything is linked, right? I mean, should everyone at the department be thinking of themselves as a risk manager? Let me give you a more global view. The great divide between private sector and public sector. Private sector has figured this out. Anything that adversely impacts the bottom line, they attack it. Government, and I'm not being rude here, just very blunt. You know what, Gordon? You're a nice guy, but bad things are just going to happen, and there's nothing you can do. That is utter nonsense. Bad things do not have to happen. Identifiable risks are manageable risks. So with respect to who's in charge in, in the fire department, well, show me your organizational chart. And I challenge fire chiefs around America, around Canada, around the world. Show me your, your organizational chart, your city, your county, your state organizational chart. Where will I find risk management on the organizational chart in any government agency? If it's on there, I'm surprised. If it's anywhere near the top where it's got some influence, I'm doubly surprised. When I do see it, it's usually in the basement. Does it have its own box? Oh, no, 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 no. Finance slash risk management maintenance slash risk management and my favorite hr slash risk management. risk management you know who's got the highest levels in every government organizational chart or the city attorneys and the county councils and the state's attorney generals you know now walk down this logical road with me the people whose bias is post-incident correction are at the highest levels of every government organizational chart, and the people whose bias is pre-incident prevention are not on the organizational chart, and we wonder why we got so many problems. So let's narrow it down to the fire service. Yeah, the fire chief is the chief risk officer also in that department, but everybody up and down the chain, chain of command, regardless of rank, regardless of assignment, has to manage their own risks. And when you're doing your job, you gotta be asking this question all the time. What's the risk involved in what I'm doing? And how can I best manage that risk? Can I eliminate the risk? Can I share the risk? Can I transfer the risk? Can I manage that risk? And if you're into the risk management thing, okay, how am I going to manage that risk? And you manage risk through systems. The whole process, again, properly designed, kept up to date, fully implemented. That's how you manage risk is by knowing those department policies and following the darn things. If you're um, a new chief or, you know, actually any, just any, anyone who's listening to this and you're curious about, well, gosh, I wonder how strong is my organization or where do we need to improve? What tools do you suggest uh, to, or where do you suggest starting to look and to get a better idea of evaluating your own department or organization? Malcolm Gladwell's got a great book. It's on my reading list called Blink. Blink. The brain gives you the unique ability to take a look at something and draw all sorts of conjecture from that one little observation. So let me talk to you about Los Angeles City Fire Department. I have dealt with a lot of fire departments over the decades. You take a look at any piece of equipment on Los Angeles City Fire Department, any piece of equipment, and you say, my gosh, how much time did they spend making that look so good? On the chief scars, and this is back in the 70s when I'm brand new, but I take a look at things. They had a siren in the grill of the chief scars. And I was absolutely, totally impressed because I've seen a lot of sirens on a lot of chief scars. But somebody in Los Angeles City Fire Department took the grill and it had all these little slats in the grill. They cut it out and then they reformed the slats to the outside of the fire. Somebody cut those just the appropriate length. And since it's curved, they also curved those slats so it fit in there perfect. And I said to myself, if that's how much they care about the way their equipment looks, I bet you this is a very, very, very squared away organization. And I hold Los Angeles City Fire Department up as they are a very, very, very good squared away thing. You know, that they, they do well at what they do, but it's that, that blink moment. So when I get invited into a fire department, the first thing I ask for is, can I take a look at your policy manual? Can I take a look at your policy manual? And well, uh, we really don't have a manual, Gordon. We have some memos where we put them together. <laughs> you know, let me take a look at your vehicle operations policy. Let me take a look at your harassment policy. Let me take a look at your policy on uh, HIPAA. Let me take a look at your policy on releasing information to the public. Well, we really don't have that. You know, so that's a blank moment, you know, a, a blank moment. Another blank moment I have is when I meet people for the first time from a department. 
You can learn so much. So what was the last nonfiction book you read? What was the last nonfiction book you read? I asked this of cops. I asked this of firefighters. And, you know, most of the time the comment is, well, I, I really don't read. Well, you need to read. And you need to read a lot. And I'm, I'm just being very blunt here. A lot of people in public safety are uh, ignorant as to what's going on in your world, not just your department, but what's going on in the world of public safety, in the world of the fire services. One of my legacy projects is entitled Your Black Swan is Somebody Else's Gray Rhino. Now, both these books are on my recommended reading list, The Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Taleb and The Gray Rhino by Michelle Walker. The Black Swan, the unknown unknowns, and the gray rhinos, these massive beasts that are coming right at us, we can see them coming, and we refuse to get out of the way. And sometimes people get all shocked. Wow, who would have ever dreamed that that could have happened here? Well, just because it hasn't happened here doesn't mean it hasn't happened in the profession. And this is why I'm a big fan of Fire Rescue One, because they take these stories not just from around America, but from around the world, and they publish them. That's good reading material. Read and talk to it with your teammates, your fellow crew members. Hey, did you read what happened in Australia? They had this building collapse. It was a brick building and it collapsed and it buried a fire apparatus. Fortunately, nobody was on the rig at the time, but somebody could have got hurt. What can we learn? It's a black swan to you, but it's a gray rhino for your profession. Yeah. So in when I have conversations with people, I'm always impressed when I know that they are aware of what's going on, not just in their department, but in the industry. Well, and that's really the goal of this podcast, actually, to, to try to bring those things to, to light into attention. We had Chief, um, uh, tr the, at the time, FDNY's training chief, uh, Liban, and I just uh, recently in the news, they had a really uh, large crane fire that was you know, ignited well over the city block. And um, the next day, he had, a, he had a bulletin out about- yep what happened, how to, um, you know, how to recognize it, how to put it out and, and, uh, good, strong organizations, as you were saying, do that and, uh, good individuals who want to be better. Hence the name of, of this podcast, hopefully all of our listeners, uh, want to dig into those things that they don't necessarily know about because they know they can be risky. So let's move, let's go back to the individual now. Um, let's unless go back you to Chief Leap for a second. Yeah. Let's yes. Go back to Chief Leap. I met him. He picked me up at the airport to do some work for FDNY and en route. So what are you reading? Holy moly. Yeah. This guy, you know, he doesn't read one book at a time. He's got several buckets, you know, and I was extremely impressed with the breadth and the depth of his knowledge. And I said to myself, FDNY is lucky to have him. And when I mentioned that, he reminded me of Arnold, uh, excuse me, uh, Schwarzkopf, Norman Schwarzkopf at the end of Gulf War One. Uh, the news media said, General Schwarzkopf, boy, we're lucky to have you. You did an excellent job on Gulf War One," And his response was so typical of people like him. It was just my turn up. Any one of the generals could have done as good a job as I could. When I said that to Chief Lee, he had the exact same feeling about FDNY. His, the other chiefs there, he says, anybody could have done it as well as I have. It just happened to be my turn up. You know, and when people have that type of attitude where excellence is the norm, not the deviation, it's not just an A shift or a B shift or a C shift thing. This is a departmental thing where we make excellence the norm, not the deviation. That's the people I want to work for. That's the people I want to be around. Yeah, it's a culture thing, right? Yep. Uh, Ritz Carlton has that same kind of approach, right? You don't have to necessarily be public safety to get that good sports organizations. You walk into that organization's door and you understand what they stand for. And, um, and that starts with the culture. Um, well, I'm just a simple cop, so I can't afford to go to the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> I can't. Firefighter, you would... Well, you, I'm actually going back to school and I just had to do a, a, a an actual, uh, essay on it. So that's the only reason why I know. About <laughs> it. Uh, but, uh, but you know, it's a, it's a prime example of how excellence is a cultural issue. Um, and you talk about organizationally, it, it starts with really solid policy and leadership. From the individual standpoint, one of the things that you've really focused on over the years is to look at, uh, maybe look in the mirror and say, are you physically, mentally capable individually and ready? And you mentioned earlier on in the podcast about us in the fire service, we do a horrible job of taking care of ourselves. What's the message that you're really trying to push uh, to, to hit that, uh, to get us to act on that particular um, idea? 
Well, another 17 prong question. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Yep. Uh, but I'll take them one at a time. First of all, on my recommended reading list is a great book by Dr. Tony Kern, K-E-R-N. It's called Going Pro. A little bit about Dr. Kern. He's a B-1 pilot by trade, now retired, and he's a very prolific author and probably the smartest person I've ever met and a very, very affable person, a nice guy. In Going Pro, he talks about the three levels of professionalism. So having stood in front of firefighters and cops for 42 years on the lecture circuit, I've learned something. Give me a group of 100 firefighters. 10 of them don't want to be there. Give me a group of 100 cops. 10 of them don't want to be there. This is nonsense. This is waste of my time. 80, 85 are good people who would do what they're told. And then there's 5 to 10% who want to change the world. In Dr. Kern's book, he mirrored my thinking by saying there's three types of members of the fire service. Level one, you're a member. Level two, you, you comply with the rules. Level three, you're constantly trying to make excellence the norm, not the deviation. So going back to parts two through 10 of your question was when you look in the mirror in the morning, are you that stone cold professional? Are you that person who wants to make excellence the norm, not the deviation? Are you fully and adequately trained to do your rightful work? Are you in good enough shape to do your rightful work? Do you have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to do your rightful work? And again, recognizing what your rightful work is, is better protecting the members of your community, not just length of life, but quality life, and simultaneously better protecting the members in your organization. And that's been the weak link in both of our professions over the years. Uh, I can recall 40 years ago, a firefighter after 10, 15 years, seeing all the things that firefighters see, a cop seeing all the things that a cop sees, that wears on you. Dr. David Black from Cortico talked mm -hmm. about how your average American has five major events in their life that uh, are significant. And firefighters and cops have like 20 times that many over their lifespan. And that wears on you. 40 years ago, if you raise your hand and said, I, I'd like to talk to somebody about this, you would have got laughed out of the place. You would have got laughed out of the place. Today, it's acceptable. The stigma is slowly but surely being erased, but it's still there. You know, knowing the, the job requires, you know, people who are physically and mentally fit, ready to do their job. I am a big fan of the whole counseling component, the wellness component, taking care of yourself. Was that always part of the vision when you were thinking about risk management? Because when we talk about, fire ground dangers and safety. Every, that's where people's minds are, go first, is fire ground risk, incident risk, incident management. But the health risks are so critical. And I'm just curious if that was always a part of where it started with you or if that came later in the process of risk management. You know, when I was brand new, I worried about the operational risks, getting our jobs done right. But as you grow older and look at all of the problems we have, that gradually expanded into a much bigger picture. And the whole mental health issue, uh, when, I, when I do a cops, a live group of cops, and it's very sad to even say, how many of you, I'll have 200 cops in an audience, how many of you personally knew a cop who was murdered? In 200, maybe a half a dozen hands will go up. On the outside, 10. I'll reverse that question. How many of you personally knew a cop who committed suicide? And almost every hand goes up. With that wake-up call that I got about a decade ago where cops are much more likely to kill themselves than to be killed, that just scared me to death. And the mental health issues in the fire service are equally severe, equally severe. And you have a lot of issues which people try to self-medicate with alcohol, drugs, and other things, and it just doesn't work for them. So I am a big fan of that, that formal mental health. And also, you know, oh, my city's got an EAP, so I don't have to worry about this. You know, I'm just being very, very blunt here. Uh, I know a lot of police organizations that have an EAP, and they're just a generalist type of uh, psychologist. And a firefighter or a cop comes in who behaves like firefighters and cops do, where they've seen just about everything. And right away, this generalist dismisses them as, well, this guy's nuts. She's just goofy. Did you hear what she said? You know, no, that's what she sees every day. And she's reflecting this. You need a specialist 
who understands your profession. I encourage firefighters to find an EAP, a psychologist who understands the fire service, preferably a firefighter, you know, someone who actually did the job because they will get it right away. And I think that better relationship with the therapist will also uh, expedite your healing process and make you better. But if you're talking to somebody who thinks you're nuts, you're not going to get any place. Absolutely. You know, we had Dr. Rochelle Zemlock on the show uh, not that long ago, and she was such a fantastic, uh, in, you know, offered such fantastic insight about what it's like to be a fire service mm -hmm. focused or public safety focused psychologist, also being married to a firefighter and having those insights. I highly recommend anyone yep. check out that show and her book as well. Um, she has such good advice, but her her messages really come back to communication and being open and talking with each other and figuring out that you have many options to deal with whatever it is you're facing. It doesn't have to just be an EAP. There are so many different options. And if you're feeling weird about going through your EAP through the department, there are other yep. options out there for you as well. Uh, I have a so good friend who does a this, shout uh, out to her. Dr. Ed Sherman, uh, also mm, brilliant, yes, brilliant, brilliant guy, was a cop, yeah. was a firefighter, and then picked up his doctorate degree and he gets it. You know, he like um, Semlock or Dr. Semlock, you know, they, they really eat, sleep and breathe the profession. So they know these things that are going on. It's, it's so nice to talk to people like that. Absolutely. Yeah. She nailed me after the first five minutes. I think she said, Hey, do you want to do a session <laughs> live on the podcast? <laughs> of course I wish I said yes. Um, but it's, it's an overwhelming theme of a lot of the leaders that we've had on. They all suggest and say, you know, um, you know, therapy is good. It, it's, it's, uh, it's one that I believe, uh, you know, as you enter the fire service, you should go every year, even if you think you're, you're feeling right. Um, uh, would you agree with that? And I'm going to, of course, cause I ask because you can handle numerous questions at the same time, I, I kind of have a personal question because you're so passionate about helping first responders. Was there ever a time in your life when you 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 have the, the law agency, you have Lexapol, you had family, you still had trauma from the job you did too? Was, was there ever a point that you were a little overwhelmed and what did you do and what would you recommend to someone if they're going through that? Well, yes. The answer to your question is yes. There were some times when I was just so upside down with, with grief and concern and just so many things going on where I wasn't doing anything right at all. It was just overwhelming to me. Two things. Number one, uh, my lovely bride. My lovely bride, uh, we've been married now 40 years and she has been the rock. She has been the pillar. She has been that person who just has been 100% in, in support. You know, early on in the days of Lexable when I was getting it started, I had a lot of naysayers. Won't work. It won't work. It won't work. It won't work. And we were spending our retirement money on making this work. Mm -hmm. And my lovely bride, who's not in the business, said, it'll work. And I said, sweetheart, you don't know the business. She goes, but I know you. You will make it work. And, you know, to have the woman that I respect that I love so much say, you can make it work, that was so important to me. Also, the bosses on the California Highway Patrol, uh, particularly Commissioners uh, Maury Hannigan, Spike Helmick, uh, Mike Brown, Joe Farrow, uh, Amanda Ray, uh, and Warren Stanley, and the current commissioner, Sean Jiri. I have known all of these people. And when I was active, particularly, uh, they went out of their way to uh, allow me to do what I did with the ultimate goal of benefiting not just the department, but benefiting the profession. So as I look at my lovely bride and the bosses I had at the CHP over the uh, 30, 33 years that I was there, and the current bosses they have there now, they have treated me so well, allow me to do these things. Uh, so it, it, yes, but I, I, at times I was overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed. It, when you look back at all the things that you've accomplished through Lexapol, is there, is there a moment or a story that's that, that just, you know, some, maybe someone approaches you and says, thank you for what you did. This is, you know, uh, you've made such an impact with our organization. Is there one that stands out where you said, you know what? I did the right thing. I'm making an impact. You know, you're going to bring me to tears on these things. Uh, in my little world, Aaron, I'm nobody. I've just been very, very fortunate to do what I do. If you're a fan of divine intervention, I am a victim of divine intervention. You know, 
Uh, a lot of things have gone on in my life that just didn't make any sense. But I can tell you this with all honesty. Every day I get an email from somebody. Every day I get an email from somebody. Today it was an email from a lieutenant on uh, University of Purdue Police Department. And he sent me a very lengthy uh, email about uh, a recent article that I had written how it made a difference to him and how it validated so much of what he did. When people, you know, talk to you at conferences, your program saved my life. You know, holy moly, saving somebody's life. I have been so fortunate to do what I do. Fortunately, people listen and there's not a day that goes by that I don't get rewarded uh, by some phone call or some email saying that I'm doing good stuff. That is so important. You know, and I'll, I'll just drill down a little bit further than this. Um, I was honored to be a eulogist at Alan Bernasini Services. Most recently, I was a eulogist at uh, Bobby Halton's Services in uh, Indiana. And I, I, I have three eulogies planned for the rest of this year. People who know they're dying have called me up and said, Gordon, mm -hmm. would you do my eulogy? I base my eulogies around Linda Ellison's great poem, The Dash. If you've never read it, you can Google it, Linda Ellison, E-L-L-I-S-O-N. And she's got this poem called The Dash. A book has been written about that poem by Mac Anderson. It's also called The Dash. Go to any cemetery. There's a date of birth and a date of death. What's in between them? It's The Dash. So what did you do during that period of time that you were on earth? Everyone in public safety, and I'm addressing firefighters today, everybody you get an opportunity every day to make a positive change in somebody's life. There are people watching this today that have saved the baby out of a house. There are people who revived a grandma or a grandpa. There are people who've done magnificent things, probably a lot of them. Well, you're benefiting them, but simultaneously you're building your dash because that knowing that you're making a difference is so crucial as you go through your life. What have you done to improve the quality of life of others? You know, as a kid, you hear, oh, it's better to give than to receive. And you say, what a bunch of nonsense that is. I just want to receive. I don't want to give. As you get older, you recognize the value of giving, giving your time, giving your knowledge, giving your expertise, taking the time to tell people they're doing a job, making their day, showing them a better way to do things. That really enhances the value of your dash. And sometimes that's really hard. Uh, that's why it's so hard to work on yourself because we get addicted almost in a way to helping everyone else. We forget about ourselves, yeah. right? Well, it was interesting because Alan Bernasini would always ask, how are you doing? And you'd follow up with the usual, everything's good. So what's going on? What's going on? He genuinely had that interest in you to make sure everything was okay. And I know a lot of leaders in both of our services who think that same way. So when you, know, you, when you ask, how are you doing? That's the very important thing. You know, and I'll bore you with this. Uh, if I ever get accused of being a good sergeant and, and people is, oh, you were a great sergeant, only because I had a great sergeant, uh, the company officer role in, in law enforcement, it's that first line supervisor, the sergeant. And my sergeant was a fellow named Jack Becker. And he was my sergeant. And he never sat in the office. He was always on his motorcycle. He was always out there keeping an eye on the cops, what they were doing. He was very interested in you. And I'll just bore you with this. One day I'm standing in the hallway and Gordon, Sarge, everything okay, son? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, are you sure? And I said, "I'm, yeah, I'm sure. He goes, you're taking Thursday off this week. You never take Thursdays off. You always take Sundays and Mondays off. Why are you taking Thursday off? Holy moly. He knew enough about me to know what my schedule was, you know? And I said, oh, sir, I got a dead day, and if I don't burn it, I'll use it by, lose it by the end of the month. And he says, my gosh. He said, that would just be wonderful. I've got Thursday off also. Is there any way you can come up to my house for dinner? A sergeant inviting a motorcycle cop to the house for dinner? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I put on my best pair of corduroys and a brand new T-shirt. And I drove up to his house on my private motorcycle and his wife answered the door with this big smile on her face. So you're Gordon Graham. Jack tells me you're the hardest working cop in the office. Jack tells me you're going to school. Jack tells me you did this and this and this and this and this. 
I had no idea how personally vested he was in my success. And to me, that is just, that's the great divide between good supervisors and great supervisors. The ones who take a personal interest in their people. Captain Ray Johnson, first black captain on the California Highway Patrol. The guy had a, um, a Xerox memory. So how's Renee doing? How are Sarah and Jacob doing? Mm. He could remember your kids' names. And automatically, you, you wanted to work for that fellow because he just knew so much about you and genuinely con was concerned about you. And for all you bosses out there, you know, the number one complaint I get from firefighters and from cops around America is the only time I hear from my boss is when something's wrong. You know what? You're, you people do, your people do a lot more right than they ever do wrong. Catch your people doing something right. Pat them on the back. Praise in public. Ratify the good behavior. Encourage future good behavior. Make it your goal every day to say five, pick five different people and say something good about their work to them. And that will just multiply and multiply and multiply. Catching your people doing something right. Uh, I love that. I can't uh, think of a better kind of segue into uh, what we like to do here to get to know you better personally. Uh, it's maybe our attempt at trying to be a good example of leadership because we like to put our guests on what, what we call the hot seat where we kind of dig in and find out more personal things. But it, I, I did want to just say the theme of uh, a lot of the great leaders that we've had on the show uh, is, I think it, it, you just highlighted, I think the essence of leadership with that last kind of three minutes and we greatly uh, appreciate and support. And uh, we, we can like, we're actually texting each other in between going, this is, this is awesome. We could probably just stop this whole thing here, but we do want to <laughs> dig in a little bit more and uh, know a little bit more about Gordon Graham. And uh, of course, then if someone ever sees you that they should come up and say, thank you. And maybe ask how you're doing for once. Right. And that'll, that'll spur on a great conversation. So um, let's give them some material for that. Huh, Janelle? <laughs> Sounds good. Where was I the other yeah, day? I was at uh, San Francisco airport at the red carpet club and a fellow came up to me and he said, Hey, you taught me in the Kavanaugh DUI class. It's a how to arrest a drunk driver class 20 years ago. I never forget the things you said. It made a difference in my career. You know, and here I am just changing airplanes at the airport. And that guy just made my day. 20 years ago, you you remember something I said in a class and it's changed your life. And, you know, and I, have, I am the luckiest guy you'll ever meet. As I tell people, I'm madly in love. The kids are doing great. I got a job. And I, I'm just so fortunate to be able to do what I do. Well, Gordon, we so appreciate you being here and everything you've done for the fire service. So uh, starting off the hot seat, I'd like to know what was, do you have a best question that has ever come up during your many, many presentations over the years? Was there ever a question someone asked from the audience that just knocked your socks off and you thought, oh my gosh, that's a, such a great question. Wow. Um, th there have been a number of questions that surprised me where, um, and you know, oftentimes I, I get fooled by questions where, uh, people will ask things that are well over their pay grade. Where you think, wow, that is a very deep, well thought out question. Um, I, I guess the one that pops up most commonly is, um, it, it, it's not really a question, it's more of a statement. Gordon, you're not in the fire service. How do you know so much about my fire department? I'll go in and give a class, Gordon, we, we didn't talk to you in advance about the problems we have. But how do you know so much about our fire department? And I say that, I hear the same thing on the cop side. And my response is, it's the same circus with different clowns. It's just, it's just universal. Don't think that you're special, that your problems are your problems and nobody else has them. Your black swan is somebody else's gray rhino. So the one that surprises me the most often is people think their department is somehow special where this is only going on mm -hmm. in their department. No, it's not. So I guess that's the surprise I get is that how little people know about what's going on in the industry and they think it's something very, very special. Got it. That's a good one. We have a, a tendency to do that. We, we make some really uh, general statements and thoughts. And here's one that my crew wanted to ask you uh, because you are a police officer. 
uh, when you go. Excuse, and excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. State Highway Patrol. I'm okay. sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. State Highway Patrol. Former a taller. Uh, a taller. Yeah, retired. Okay. State. State. A little taller than a cop. Uh, when you go to the office, do you park in front of the hydrant? <laughs> No, and I don't park in red zones either, you know, okay. and okay. I don't park next to vans with sliding doors. And I try to stay away from electric vehicles because they have a tendency to do things that they're not supposed to do right away. But, you know, <laughs> everything you do involves risk. You know, I, I am amazed what people will remember from my lectures back in the 1980s. You know, oh, Mr. Graham, when I pull into a gas station, if I see a tanker truck there, I make a U-turn and I go to a different gas station, you know. And Mr. Graham, when I go into a mall and I see an armored car there, I leave. I'm not coming out, you know. Hey, Mr. Graham, you know, I see that rolling ball. I know that a rolling ball is always followed by a running child. And all these little things that I've said were I've created these memory markers for people. Dr. Lawrence Gonzalez is on my recommended rating list, and he's the guy who introduced me to this concept of memory markers, behavioral scripts. I got one from Alan Bernicini once. All smoke is poison. Now, as a, a cop, I'm thinking, you know, some smoke is, but if it was really, really dark, that's bad for you. But the light stuff, that's okay. You can breathe that. No, 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 no. All smoke is poison. All smoke is poison. I tell cops, fire, firefighters also, you take a gun off somebody, someone automatic pistol, you got the uh, magazine out. Remember, there's one in the chamber. A lot of cops and a lot of firefighters have been embarrassed and hurt because they forgot there was one in the chamber. You know, uh, the one my dad gave me, a rolling ball is always followed by a running child. And I'll give you all this one. Don't armor all the seat on your Harley. <laughs> oh, go ahead and laugh. Nobody told me that. Nobody told me that. And one day, Sergeant Becker told me, Graham, your bike looks like hell. Clean it up. And I was not a neat freak on these things. So I cleaned it all up, wiped down the tank, did, you know, did all the bike. The seat was looking a little ratty. So I armor all the seat, wiped it down. Got it looked good. I went to bed, got up the next morning, fired that bad boy up. This is 1974. The old Harley Davidson, potato, 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 potato. Yep. And I yep. fired that bad boy up. I'm headed off to work and typical. I'm running a little bit late. So I'm doing 65 at a 40 zone on Lakewood Boulevard and the light goes yellow and I'm about a hundred feet away from the light. Had I been on my Kawasaki, which I got next, man, I would have been there through the thing in heartbeat. The old Harley just wasn't up to it, you know? So I slammed on the front brake, slid off the seat, up the gas tank. And these are the days before recess gas caps. I have a permanent memory marker as a result of that incident. Oh, so no. don't armor all the seat on your oh, Harley. No. Oh. Well, that went right into my question of what was the best piece of advice you ever received. And I think we can, <laughs> we can check that, that box. Leave off. with that. Don't yeah. I, all the seat on your Harley. <laughs> don't. Uh, no, those weren't. Tires other. I mean, every motorcycle rider knows this. And, you know, don't armor all your tires. My gosh, they, you're on the side of the tires. If you got armor all on there, you know, and I'll, I'll bore you with this. I'm sitting in graduate school in 1975, and uh, it's all military class. I'm the non-military guy. And on night one, I, I, I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at all these men, uh, you know, older men, all of them military veterans, you know, and they're all in their 40s and 50s. And I'm the kid sitting there, 25 years old, and I had no clue what was going on. We had a professor standing up there, a guy named Harry Hurt. Harry Hurt. And at the end of the night, okay, your reading assignment is this, this, and this. Your reading assignment, blah, 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 blah. Enjoy your week. Please work safely. Mr. Graham, could I see you for a minute? <laughs> so I didn't say a thing during the class, so I know I'm not in trouble. So yes, sir. And he goes, I take it you're non-military. And I said, how'd you know that? He says, well, your hair. And also you have a quizzical look on your face. You really <laughs> have no clue what's going on, do you? I said, I have no clue. And he says, please do me a favor. Don't give up. Don't quit. He said, you'll catch on pretty quick. You'll catch on pretty quick. What do you do? I said, I'm with the California Highway Patrol. And he said, are you a motorcycle cop by chance? I said, I am. And he looked at me and he said, I'm working on a federal grant to study motorcycle fatalities around America. Would you like to be part of my collection team? You know, my dad taught me this back when I was a kid. Life is three thirds. First third learn, second third do, third third enjoy. Mm -hmm. In that first third, a basic rule, take every opportunity you're given and talk to everyone. 
And I'm not bad mouthing anybody, but these are two dying traits today. We don't talk to each other and we don't take opportunities. Uh, is there overtime involved? Oh, no, I don't want anything to do with it. Take every opportunity. So Harry Hurt and his crew of investigators studied a thousand motorcycle fatalities. And if you're a motorcycle rider, you got to go online and get the Hurt Report, download the PDF. Uh, you'll see my name on page 15 as a contributor, G.J. Graham as a contributor. But we very quickly identified the number one cause of motorcycle fatality way back 75, 76, 77. And it's left-hand turns. And for all the people who ride who were watching this, you've almost been killed on a left-hand turn. You're going down the road, minding your own business. Some fool makes a left directly in front of you. They regularly hit motorcycle riders. And then the cops show up and they talk to the driver of the car that made the left. And the driver of the car always says the same thing. I never saw the bike. Mm -hmm. Are they telling the truth? So the question became in 75, 76, 77, why can't people see motorcycles and what can we do about it? Identify and evaluate a risk, develop, select, implement a control measure. Why can't people see motorcycles? Uh, back in the 70s, you had an option on your headlight on your bike. You could turn your headlight on or off anytime you wanted. That was your option. As a result of the Hurt Report, the option was taken away. Effective January 1, 1981, we got a new federal new motor vehicle safety standard. The second you turn on the ignition on your bike, what happens? Headlight comes on. And check the data from 82, 83, 84, 85, 86. Motorcycle fatals involving bikes with mandatory headlights went which way? Down. Yeah. Big time. Well, Gordon, that's a good story. No, it's not. I was riding a motorcycle for the Highway Patrol in 1981. The second the CHP found out about the new law, they immediately requested a waiver from the federal government. That law does not apply to the California Highway Patrol. Why not? Officer safety. Mm -hmm. Officer safety? We have to have the ability to turn our headlight off in case we're being shot at. Well, let's check the data. How many of our cops have been killed because they could not turn the headlight off? Oh, that's right, none. <laughs> and how many have we lost from left-hand turn wrecks? Over 100. Your black swan is somebody else's gray rhino. Mm -hmm. You know, we get worked up on the wrong stuff. Some of the stuff that we think is oh so risky is not. And some of the stuff that's not even on your radar yet is the stuff that's going to come back to haunt you. So again, that role of that chief officer being the chief risk officer and teaching everybody to be a good risk manager. And by the way, for every firefighter watching this, you're the best risk manager you got in your life. Manage your risks. Manage your risks and things will work out better for you. Well, you know, and Gordon, you have such an amazing way of taking very complicated topics and making them feel very simple and com like just common sense. I want to get in your head just a little bit for a moment, if, if you'll allow me. <laughs> Do you have a process, like when you're thinking about how to convey this type of information to cops, firefighters, whoever it might be, do you have a process for kind of like how you break it down into smaller pieces? Are you a note taker? Are you a stare at the sky guy? Like what is your, what is your process? Well, uh, I'll tell you, I did a webinar with Dr. Tony Kern and during the preparation of the webinar, and I'd known him for a decade. Uh, when I used to teach at the FBI Academy, I would stop off at his office in Manassas, Virginia and, and visit him every opportunity I got. The guy was that smart. And so when I did this webinar with him, I said, Dr. Kern, you are the smartest person I've ever met. And he chuckled and he said, I don't know if that's true. I do know I am intensely curious. I have never considered myself smart, but I am extremely curious. And I think that curiosity allows me to look at things and break it down into subsets exactly why is this going on? And that curiosity makes you think more and more about things. Uh, again, I'm boring you with this, but uh, you, know, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm not working in the morning, I take a hike up and down um, the beach here in Huntington Beach, California. And I walk three and a half miles up the beach and I walk three and a half miles down the beach and I walk 3.5 miles an hour. So you're doing the math on this. You're saying, I bet you it takes you two hours to do your walk. No, it takes me three because I stop and talk to everybody. And one fellow I talk to, and you can Google this, all the viewers of this, you can Google this. The mayor of Bolsa Chica, B-O-L-S-A-C-H-I-C-A. And his name is Joe Bush, the mayor of Bolsa Chica. 
And I met this guy about 10 years ago as I was walking up and down the beach. And I say hi to everybody. I say hi to everybody. He's, you know, hi, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? This guy's in a walker. He's old. He's got a Navy cap on and a Navy jacket on. And I stopped one day and I said, I'm Gordon Graham. He says, I'm Joe Bush. And I said, I take it you're World War II. And he, his eyes light up. Yep, World War II. And I'm 93 and I'm going to make it to 100. I'm 93 and I'm going to make it to 100. And our conversations continue today. Uh, I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks. So you, you never know. This might be dated. But last time I talked, I'm 101. I'm shooting for 102. I'm 101. I'm shooting for 102. And the guy is just so full of energy and mentally, mentally sound, a good, strong grip still. One day, about eight or nine years ago, I asked, I said, what do you think about while you're walking? Because as I'm walking, I'm thinking about things new things I can do in my lectures, new things I can do for Lexapol. How can I make things better? What can I do to make things better? And I asked this 97, 98 year old guy this. So what do you think about while you're walking? Are you ready for his answer? I revisit every mission I had in World War II. If I ever got called up, how would I do it better? And he was dead serious. Hmm. He's closing in on a hundred. If my nation ever needs me again, if I get called up, Here's how I do it better. I have been so fortunate to meet people like that throughout my life. These people who are just constantly looking for the next best way of doing things. So, you know, uh, Joe Bush, God bless him. You know, America's lucky to have people like that. Yeah. As we're lucky to have you, uh, like Joe Bush, what are you doing uh, every day to get better? Well, you know, I, on my days off when I don't have webinars or anything to do, I always take my hike. I enjoy my hike. That relaxes me. And then I come home and I take a nap and uh, get caught up on the emails. And uh, in the afternoon, I'm able to take my boat out and uh, going out in the boat's always fun. Uh, I had a lady friend. Uh, I was I had a friend who was a cop and we went to a hospital together in 1974. And there was a nurse. He was with a different department. There was a nurse, absolutely gorgeous young lady. And um, uh, I was thinking about asking her out, but I take forever to do anything. He asked her out. And 50 years later, they're still married and they're madly in love. Um, I invited them out on my boat once and she was a nurse and he was a cop. Hard to believe, hard to believe that people like that get together. And at the end of it, they had a nice time. She called me up and she said, can we do it again next weekend? And I said, sure. So she shows up and we get on the boat and she's got a blood pressure cuff. And she puts the blood pressure cuff on her husband. <laughs> and she's looking at this thing. And she wrote something down. And then two hours later, when we came back, she took his blood pressure. And there was a significant decrease in both the upper and lower levels over that two-hour ride. And I had never given any thought is how relaxing the water is. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, how do I relax? I'll either sit on my porch and overlook the, the water, or I'll be out on the water or walking along the water. There's something about the water that gives me great relaxation and great peace. What would you like people to take from this? Well, number one, recognize how important your job is to make America better. You've had that opportunity every day to make a positive change in somebody's life, not just length of life, but quality of life. Simultaneously, do not forget taking care of those you love because they're the ones that will always, always be with you. You know, I, I, I have a, a speech. Occasionally, I will go to a conference, a fire chief conference, and I'm not a speaker, but I wanted to listen to somebody. So they see you there and they'll say, oh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Graham's in the audience. Uh, you know, you stand up. Gordon, would you like to say a couple words? Well, what do you say to that? No. <laughs> you know, so I have several what I call throwdown speeches. And they can go from three minutes to an hour, depending on how many stories you want to tell in there. But if you want to live a long time, not just length of life, but quality of life, my 10 Fs, my 10 Fs. And Janelle, I'll send these over to you so you can post them on some place where people can get these. You want to live a long time, not just length of life, but quality of life, family, faith, friends, food, fun, funds, fitness, function, freedom, and fulfillment. Family, take care of your family. Faith, have a faith. Believe in a higher power. Friends, you don't need 100 friends. You don't need 20 friends. You got two or three people you can really count on that's good. Food. If your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, don't eat it. And everything in moderation. Family, faith, friends, food, fun. 
enjoy life, laugh a lot, funds, funds. You know, everybody in the fire service, your goal should be to retire debt-free, retire debt-free, and have a plan, to develop an action plan on how to retire debt-free. So, you know, if you choose to work post-retirement, good for you, but you should be able to enjoy your retirement. Family, faith, friends, food, fun, funds, fitness, keep yourself in shape. You don't have to be a bodybuilder, but keep on moving. Family, faith, friends, food, fun, fun, fitness, function, keep yourself busy. Uh, freedom, be grateful you live in the United States of America. And if I ever took over this country, and I have a plan, but I can't get in all the details with you. But if I ever took over this country, everybody who turns age 18, you're going overseas for two years. Whether it's in the military or in the Peace Corps or some other faith-based group or something. You know, uh, my, my son did his graduate work in Manila working with prostitutes in the slums. And I visited him in Manila and these people had zero hope. And they were the happiest people I've ever met in my life. They were happy. We got people born in this country, probably the richest country that's ever existed. I hate this place. I hate this place. Go overseas and learn how lucky you are to live in the United States of America. Do we have problems? Oh yeah, we got problems and we're not perfect. But I'm telling you, we are light years at any place else. And every time I come back from overseas, when that customs fellow says, welcome home, that means a lot to me because I'm home in this great country known as the United States. And finally, fulfillment. Make sure you're making a difference in people's lives. So the 10 Fs, that's a good thing to live by. Perfect. Perfect summary to a lot of the lessons that you live by and, and that you um, also teach to us. And again, our own gratitude towards you. Uh, thank you for starting Lexapol, for being you, for being here today. Um, and uh, to all our listeners, you can find more of uh, Gordon on Fire Rescue One and the Lexapol blog, including today's great tips, uh, which is a series of videos that you do. Um, you can also see this podcast on YouTube and uh, you can also contact us uh, via email at better every shift at fire rescue one.com. Please rate review the show, check out more of Gordon's wisdom. And, and again, his tip series is very, very imperative to help you improve and get better. And, uh, just like, uh, Gordon had said, we need to listen to each other. We need to talk to each other, focus on those 10 F's, but most importantly, make sure that we learn something, do something and share something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks for listening, everybody. To all of you, good luck, good health, goodbye. God bless you. God bless America. And thanks for all you're doing.